Good morning. Thank you all for finding the time to join us today and visiting our webinar. I hope that everyone is staying safe and checking in on the important people in your lives. My name is Dan Mariashin. I'm CEO of B'nai B'rith International. We're joined today by our Center for Senior Services team, which is going to discuss what B'nai B'rith is doing to guide its senior housing community through the coronavirus pandemic, as well as its efforts on Capitol Hill advocating for its key stakeholders. Mark Olshin is Associate Executive Vice President of B'nai B'rith International and Director of B'nai B'rith Center for Senior Services. Mark develops, manages, and executes B'nai B'rith's affordable housing programs and senior advocacy initiatives. He first served as the Director of the Senior Citizens Housing Program, which he helped to expand from 12 buildings to 38 properties located in 26 communities throughout the United States. Mark, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Dan. Janelle Doughton. Janelle Doughton is Associate Director of B'nai B'rith Center for Senior Services. In her role with B'nai B'rith, Janelle develops and provides training for residents, staff, and managers of B'nai B'rith's non-sectarian senior housing buildings across the country. She also frequently works with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and with lawmakers on Capitol Hill to ensure the unique needs of seniors are being met. Janelle, welcome. Thank you. Evan Carmen is Legislative Director for Aging Policy at B'nai B'rith Center for Senior Services. Evan has advocated on public policy matters, including affordable housing, health care, and income security, as those issues relate to seniors with limited means. His advocacy work takes him to Capitol Hill and also includes arranging for lawmakers and their staffs to visit B'nai B'rith's uh, sponsored affordable housing buildings. We want to talk about that uh, a little bit later, too. So, Evan, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Well, let's jump right in. Uh, Mark, uh, tell us how all of this began. Now, this is a program that goes back uh, about 50 years. Um, tell us how it started and uh, lead us through where we are today. Okay, thanks, Dan. Basically, uh, we have to go back to the late 60s. Uh, for some of us, uh, the late 60s and 70s are a little blurry, but uh, the, for um, the housing program, it started in the late 60s when a uh, small group of dedicated B'nai volunteers uh, wanted to provide affordable housing for low-income seniors in their local communities. The federal, there were federal programs available that provided uh, funding for housing, and the volunteers provided what we call the sweat equity that was needed to make it actually work. So it's a real partnership between the feds who provides the bucks and the local community-based not-for-profits that actually make it happen. These, um, these volunteers petitioned the B'nai B'rith Board of Governors back then um, who agreed, and so the B'nai B'rith Senior Housing Committee and the housing program was officially born. The first application was submitted to HUD for funding in a, for a project in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. That eventually did get funded and the building opened in 1971. Today, as you mentioned, B'nai B'rith is the largest national Jewish sponsor of HUD assisted housing in the country. The network consists of 38 buildings in 27 communities with serving approximately 5,000 residents and their families. From California to upstate New York to South Florida and pretty much everywhere in between. Uh, I also want to mention that these are open to persons regardless of their um, race, religion, ethnicity, um, sexual orientations, or anything of the like. It's open to everybody who is income qualified. Now, we advocate at the national level, but we don't actually operate at the local levels. Those are done by local boards of directors and with uh, local management personnel. We provide assistance consultative services, and when needed, um, had real advice and hands-on um, uh, help. Um, additionally, we've been doing training for many years, and you'll hear more about this throughout the uh, conversation this morning, but we have uh, programs for management professionals and service coordinators. We have programs for members of our board of directors, and one of our babies, a camp retreat for the residents of the actual buildings where we bring them to a youth camp and spend some time teaching them how to be better residents and advocate on their own behalf. And Janelle has taken that one over as her baby 
and we'll be talking about that, I'm sure, uh, in this conversation. So that's yeah, pretty that's, much that's that's to empower the residents. <laughs> and so that's how we've uh, that's how the program got started. And um, when this was officially uh, pulled together back when, I was pretty much having a hand in everything. And I'm very pleased to say that my talented colleagues, who you see on the screen, um, have taken the bulk of much of that uh, work for me now. And I spend, as, as you know, much of my time assisting you with a variety of other issues that take place within the organization. So back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, what, what was the state of uh, housing for seniors uh, in, in the Jewish community uh, in, in the United States? I know we've had, you know, for years there have been um, uh, what, what used to be called old age homes, uh, now we call senior facilities in many communities. But what, what uh, was it like at that point where um, the, the leaders of B'nai B'rith uh, felt that uh, this was an important initiative uh, to provide something that perhaps wasn't being uh, completely made available. Was that, was that the thinking? Well, the thinking was, well, actually, the, the, the need was there. And as you know, the need has only gotten worse. However, the good news was there was a federal housing policy in place. And so um, those on Capitol Hill recognized that there was a need for low-income housing. And so the good folks uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, came together and created um, the affordable housing programs um, under various, um, uh, various titles, Section two, uh, 202, Section 236, and others that provided the ability to develop this type of property. Again, they were looking to local not-for-profits to do the actual work in the communities but they were willing and able to provide the funds. It was priorities and they had a real understanding uh, of the need for that type of program. So the way you've explained it, this is really community-based housing in, in the sense that uh, the, the management of day-to-day -day is not from Washington, it's not from our headquarters, that there are local boards who have been there from the beginning. Uh, and, and these properties are, are managed community by community um, in coordination uh, with B'nai B'rith. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, back when, uh, B'nai B'rith, uh, as you know, is a, was a volunteer-driven organization wanting to do good in the, in the community. It did not want to get into the business of housing um, for a variety of reasons. Um, I might argue with some of them today because I'd like to have a little more control at the local levels. However, um, the reality is that's not the way it was set up. And so what we were doing is we were assisting to get them funded, uh, we brought them because, and we had those strong local B'nai B'rith lodges and communities that could could withstand doing a lot of the work locally. So we were there to provide the structure, to provide the ability to get it funded, and then to provide the expertise to ensure that it was handled properly. So today, so how do we how do we maintain Janelle? How do we maintain contact with the with the local housing uh, committees? Now we might want to mention. You know, we're in places as, as large as New York City and Boston um, and in, in places uh, like um, uh, Allentown, Springs, Pennsylvania, Arkansas. I believe, and in, in Alabama. How do we maintain contact with each of these committees in all of these places? Okay, so the boards, the way we maintain contact is a um, couple of ways. We do have an annual training conference that brings together um, the management companies, the on-site manager, but also one or two board members, usually the board president and another officer or somebody very active in the board. Um, so to, to, to learn from each other, so, and also to um, learn from experts, but we also, there's different ways. We have um, a quarterly newsletter that um, we share information, you know, from the industry, but also from the buildings. Um, we profile residents, programs, national programs, and programs in each building to share ideas. But we also host um, going on um, on Capitol Hill, um, federal programs, the 202, that kind of stuff with HUD. And then we also um, 
talk about national programming and even things like fair housing, but we stay in touch. So those ways, also we are always on the phone with board presidents, with management companies, Companies about they call us if they have issues or sometimes even good news uh, but that's how we stay in touch with the boards we also stay in touch with the managers on-site staff and we'll talk about that a little later because that's real important to especially what's going on with COVID-19 but um, and we are having when we have emergencies whether it was the federal shutdown last year we had some video um, calls with the board presidents to keep them informed and um, we're doing that with this um, national emergency with COVID-19 we're having weekly calls we'll have one right after this video chat we will be having our weekly call with our board presidents well, I want to talk about um, COVID-19 and and how we have uh, adjusted to this pandemic and what we're doing uh, but before we get into that, uh, Evan, tell us a, a little bit about what goes on on Capitol Hill in terms of advocacy for seniors. You know, for, for a long time, uh, we, our housing program was really the, very much the focus of, of what we as Ben Averett did for seniors. Uh, but a number of years ago, uh, we started to look at the full uh, panoply uh, of issues uh, affecting seniors, particularly in healthcare, but not just healthcare. Tell us a bit about what goes on up there and how we relate to that. Sure. So um, as my colleagues previously talked about, we sponsor low-income senior housing all across the country. And the buildings are in a partnership with the federal government. Consequently, the buildings receive um, funding from the federal government every, every month. So my colleagues and I, Janelle, we go up to Capitol Hill we speak with the members of offices who represent the neighbor sponsored buildings, and we advocate for the people who live in the buildings. Certainly the biggest issue we advocate on <clears throat> is affordable housing. But that certainly doesn't stop us from advocating on Medicare, Medicaid, social security, nutrition, uh, nutrition assistance, subjects, subjects like that. But we certainly try to extend our advocacy efforts not just the capital, not just the Capitol Hill, but as you mentioned beforehand, bringing the members of Congress and their staff to our buildings all across the country. We've actually found this is probably the most effective form of uh, advocacy we do. We love to give the member or their staff a tour of the building, let them see what a Section 202 Benebrith property looks like. Let them see all the great stuff going on in the building, amenities in the building how lovely the building is, the space that the residents have. And then we like to do a town hall style format so the people who live in the building can come talk with their elected representative about the issues which matter most to them. And we really try to keep it as, you know, as you know, focused on seniors issues as possible. We want the people who live in the building to be able to ask their member, what's your view on social security? Will I be eligible for an increase soon? What's your view on affordable housing, a Medicare, a Medicaid, topics like that? We really try to make it as wide of a Q&A on seniors' issues as, as possible. Do you find that, um, and this is before the stimulus package and before coronavirus uh, hit, <clears throat> have you found that um, senior issues um, are a priority for uh, most members of Congress? Uh, is it just uh, one of a box that needs to be checked? Are there, are there uh, members uh, and offices uh, of congressmen that take a more active interest than others? Um, what do you think? I think that's fair to say. I think that it's not necessarily a yes or no answer. I think that senior issues are important to all members of Congress. I think some of the members prioritize them more than others do. I would say the Section 202 housing, housing program, which we have certainly used to, to sponsor affordable housing across the country, has received a lot of bipartisan support in Congress. Janelle and I find when we go up to Capitol, Capitol Hill from both sides of the aisle, people are really enthused about the program. 
Um, certainly when you get into other issues, for example, I'd say the big ones would possibly be the Medicaid you know, program. There, there might not necessarily be as much bi bipartisan support for that. So I think to really answer your question, it really just, just depends on the member's office and really the topic we're talking about. Right, so I'll just chime in that certainly the Section 202, we have a very good reception, bipartisan support on that. Even for the, um, the SNAP, which is what people traditionally think of as food stamps, uh, most of our bill, uh, most of the congressional offices have been very supportive of that too, because we know that most of our residents use that. Um, so, just and, let, to let you know. and if I can, if I can jump in sure, too, ahead, on this Mark. One, Dan. Yeah. And, um, um, I I always have this uh, little conversation with my colleagues. Um, back in the day, um, there was real money available. Uh, like I said, we had a federal housing policy, and um, and the federal government recognized the need for housing specifically for older adults. Um, things changed over the years, priorities. There were issues back when, when uh, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development was uh, slated to literally go out of business. But uh, there was a lot of people who put efforts into maintaining it. And unfortunately, some of the focus changed. Um, what we did at that point was we started developing a program that we called Housing with Services. And we started to let people know that these types of facilities weren't just bricks and mortar but there are far more than that. And that these people really extended their independent lifestyles by living in these properties, which down the road saved a lot of people, including the federal government, uh, significant amounts of money because they were able to live independently without going prematurely to a more institutionalized setting. And so we got a lot, of more, a lot more support for continuing the programs, expanding the programs, getting social, uh, um, service coordinators, uh, that I'm sure Janelle will address in a, in a few minutes, um, getting them involved where they could bring community-based services into the buildings to extend people's lives and get them what they need so they could stay there longer. So the, the, the idea started to change that these programs were more than just bricks and mortar. Uh, and we obviously we advocated because what we learned was people do age in place, the buildings age in place, the boards age in place, everything ages. And so we developed a real understanding for how this works and so we were seen as one of the early um, pioneers in doing all this. What's really changed is the funding for new properties. And so what we've had to do now is find new mechanisms to find ways to keep um, these programs uh, preserved for the next, the next um, generation of residents, as well as try to find ways to develop more housing for the, um, the large group of baby boomer um, individuals that are just, uh, you know, getting older each day and will eventually require this kind of housing. So the need is, is really there. Now we have, we offer, uh, or we make available about 4,000 apartments, right? About 7,500 residents. But that really is, um, uh, I suppose, in, the in terms of, of, of not only our community, but as, as you've explained, as a partner with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, this um, is non-sectarian. Uh, so there must be a tremendous need out there that needs to be filled. And it's only there is, yeah, I was going to say that um, the waiting lists at our buildings, some are closed easily uh, two, three years that you get on the wait list to when you can actually move in. Well, think about it, Dan. The last programs that we got funded under our programs was um, in Dothan, Alabama right. in 2011. So that was the last buildings that we actually were able to get uh, applications for. And we haven't been able to put one in since. Now, my colleagues will, will share with you that, and a lot because of their efforts and others like them, um, we've been getting some good signs and some monies have been put back into the 202 portfolio, but we haven't yet been able to get any more, really any more buildings up and running. We have to use other, other means. Evan, can which you is talk much to more, that for a second? Much more costly we'll and back. much more difficult. Can talk to that for a second. So we'll go back to Janelle to talk about training, and then I'd like to move into the uh, coronavirus um, issue. Um, talk about the stimulus package as it relates to seniors. What's, what's in there? Uh, and we were advocating for uh, passage of the package, um, as, as many, many millions of Americans were. Uh, but when you drill down, and it was 880 pages, what's in there for seniors? So I guess there, um, there's a lot there for seniors, but I guess I'll drill down on two major aspects. One from the affordable housing side. 
we certainly advocated strongly to Congress that because of the COVID-19 epidemic, that the cost for our sponsored buildings across the country, like so many Section 202 buildings across the country, is unfortunately going to go, go up. Administrative costs will go up, cleaning supplies, God forbid somebody needs to be quarantined. Things like that are gonna cause the administrative costs to you know, go up. So we advocated strongly to Congress that there should be additional money appropriated for the buildings and also for the service coordinator program. We were certainly pleased that Congress appropriated additional funding for the Section 202 program and also affordable housing in general. Um, it's, I, I guess it's to be determined right now if the money they appropriate is going to be enough, enough you know, funding. Obviously, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in because the issues that we're dealing with in the buildings are, one, cleaning supplies. They're finding that it's almost impossible to get cleaning supplies. Um, if they can, it's very expensive. Um, they're getting creative. Uh, we've had a lot of suggestions within the network of how to get cleaning supplies into working with actual cleaning companies um, to get those cleaning supplies. PPEs, that's something we hear about a lot. Well, guess what? Our staff need PPEs. PPEs being? PPEs that's um, being. personal protective, um, what is it? Equipment. Equipment. Equipment, yeah. And so that would be booties, gloves, masks, anything that our staff, especially maintenance, that need to go into these apartments that potentially someone could be infected or they don't want to infect the, um, the resident as well. So these are things that once you go in that apartment and you use that, you, you have to get rid of it. So there's a lot of costs that we really don't know what it's going to be ultimately. But I, want to we pick up, I want to pick up on that in, in just a second, but uh, Evan, to go back to you, if there's another stimulus package, and there's a lot of talk about that, that the, the first tranche here of $2 trillion is not going to, uh, to be enough, uh, what will we be advocating for uh, if there is another package? Sure. I certainly expect that we'd be advocating for additional money for the Section 202 program. I guess that's kind of a two-prong. We'd, we, we'd I think that we'd advocate for two separate things. One, as Janelle just talked about, we'd argue for additional um, PPEs for funding to get you know, more of those type of um, things in the building. Also, too, a lot of the Section 202 buildings, the newer buildings in particular, the smaller buildings, don't have a service coordinator in them. And the service coordinator in a building is critical to be able to bring those community-based services to help the people in the building try to navigate that. So trying to get as many service coordinators in the building as possible, advocating for funding so that the buildings right now, which can't afford a service, a service coordinator, hopefully with additional funding would be able to afford that service. Janelle, talk about training. How is that prepared? Uh, the building staffs are around the country for emergencies like the one that we're in now. And how does the network, how, do the, how does each support the other? Well, what we annually, we have a three-day meeting um, for our on-site staff. So this would be the building managers, assistant managers, the service coordinators. And we always try to touch on emergency preparedness because it's, it's a changing world. We really reacted once um, there were a lot of uh, shootings. We started doing um, active attacker training just to, you got to have a plan in place. So this past year, we've taken our, our, our managers meeting to other locations that have had disasters to learn from other housing providers, you know, what they've gone through. But last year, we took the opportunity, we went to Puerto Rico. And not that we were planning about a pandemic. Uh, it is one of the things that our buildings are aware of though and plan for. But we took them to Puerto Rico because we wanted to take the opportunity to learn from our colleagues in Puerto Rico. What happens when every, because it's an island, every part was affected by Hurricane Maria. There was no one that had electricity or water. And their healthcare system, what happened with that? Um, also the Red Cross, a huge partner in most of our communities, how they reacted to this and finding out when 
when the entire, it, a microcosm, you know, that it could be an entire country could have a national emergency. So what happens when every corner of where you live is affected? And the only way you can get away from that is to leave that island or in our case, the United States. So we took that opportunity. We had representatives from the Red Cross, um, the largest healthcare system on the island, runs most of the hospitals come and talk. And, and HUD was there too, to talk about what happens when everything breaks down and how do you prepare for that? And um, who knew that this would be such good training? Uh, we didn't specifically focus on epidemics, but what happens when the community is, is in an emergency? So how has life changed for our properties and for our residents and our staff in the three weeks that we've been now seriously into this crisis, I say seriously because we knew about it some time ago, but in terms of all of the uh, quarantine measures and lockdown measures that are, that are now being imposed, how has that affected seniors uh, in any case, uh, if they're living alone, they're living alone, they're in, they're in some way in isolation. Um, and uh, the whole idea of bringing them together uh, in, a, in, a, in a housing property and to have activities for them uh, and to have life ordered in some way, even though they may be living alone, is extremely important. Uh, but now all the more so. So how has life changed all the way around uh, for, uh, for these folks and for our, uh, our entire system of uh, folks who are living in affordable housing? Well, um, it's changed dramatically. Uh, most buildings, the staff is on rotation. So the normal staff that would be in the building is not all there at the same time. Um, the offices, they, the, when staff are there, they're behind closed doors. They can, residents can only call. Now maintenance, cleaning staff, they are there. Um, you know, to do their job, but maintenance really is just doing emergency. Um, somebody's toilet clogs up, something like that. There is no planned maintenance going on. Um, and they're but being- because, you know, our, The folks who are in our facilities are, are ambulatory. They, they, can, they can get around. There's no, there's no medical staff on site. Is that correct? Right. This is strictly independent living. So you rent an apartment, the nice thing is, as Mark described, there's service coordination, there are programs. This is, it is a community. Um, most of the buildings have a residence association, but at this point, nobody can congregate. So any of the, every building has a community room, that's closed. Um, in order to keep residents from congregating, and it's, it's awful, um, they've had to take out furniture. Um, because some people still want to get together. Uh, it's hard to understand that the hallways in your apartment building are actually considered public spaces and can be a way to transmit the virus. So basically, you still are allowed to have a visitor. Um, generally, it's just a, a family member. Um, even if you live in independent living, you may have mobility issues. You may ha have a um, healthcare worker, a caregiver um, to assist you, but you have your own apartment, your kitchen, um, you know, living room, bedroom. Uh, so, you know, but they can't come, they really can't come out of their apartments because really the hallway is just the same as being, you know, out and about in a public area or in a grocery store. So um, it's really changed dramatically. There's very little, you know, social interaction, physical, physical who social is, so interaction. So it's up to families. I assume some people don't have family members. Uh, who, who looks in on them? Who, who calls them? And, and the other thing, which is extremely important because we're all going through it uh, ourselves now, is how does food get into the hands of the residents? How, do they, how is it delivered? How do they order it? What are, what are they doing uh, with that regard? So um, who's visiting? Well, yeah, and we know a lot of our residents do not have family in the area or do not have family. So there's a variety of ways. Um, some staff is checking in on the residents. Some, it's a mixture of staff and, you know, board members um, taking on that role as well. Um, 
you know, uh, as far as food, it would be the same as any, any day. They would be responsible for getting their food. However, our service coordinators, our management know that there's some residents that this is impossible. So a lot of them, they're working with volunteers to get food, you know, shopping for the residents. Uh, we were talking about um, some of the food banks, delivering, um, working through community partners. A lot of the community partners have maybe changed their focus so their volunteers are doing other things such as shopping for seniors. Um, our service coordinators, I know in one of our, a couple of our buildings, they have been going out and buying um, toilet paper <laughs> because they know their residents can't do sure. that. Sure. And um, as far as food deliveries, they, again, community partners have been delivering food, um, some of our boards have actually paid and had food delivered from catering. Uh, just whatever they can do to help their residents. But the, a lot of the residents are helping each other, too. Sure. Um, sure. And did that long before the COVID-19. There were residents that ran errands for each other. You know, So um, one of the great things is the resident associations in the building creates that sense of community. So the residents are helping each other as well. But it is, it, it, life has changed dramatically for them. And, um, you know, social isolation is the thing we were always avoiding. And right now we're telling everybody that's what you need to do. Uh, Mark, uh, I know that you've um, had now a couple of calls with um, uh, the, the management um, or with the housing committee uh, to uh, talk about these problems, which are shared by everyone. Tell us, tell us about that. And, and the cooperation that goes on now at this, uh, uh, at this particular stage of this crisis um, with um, our, our colleagues in, in, in all of these um, facilities. Well, as Janelle was mentioning, uh, we have a very dedicated group of um, professionals as well as um, uh, board members, volunteers. Um, and what's happened is, the, in a weird way, the communities have gotten closer. Even though we can't spend as much time together with each other, um, the community has gotten closer in that they're they're clearly looking out to be helpful to those persons who are living within the buildings. So the boards are getting more more actively involved to try to be helpful. Uh, obviously, as Janelle was mentioning, the 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 limited um, amount of contact that uh, staff can have, but um, they're maintaining that they have that contact. So, you know, we we are meeting with them more regularly. Uh, I think we have a call, is it, I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, but today. Uh, we see, it, it, seems, it seems like it's almost every other day. And so uh, <laughs> the reality is that we're constantly reinforcing what needs to be done, reinforcing or learning what's going on at the various properties, and then helping each other figure out ways to, um, to deal with the issues in their own buildings. So, so there's a, sense of a real cooperation among the um, participants from the various buildings. So in a sense, the community has gotten larger but we don't see each other except for things like Zoom and other, um, you know, or, you know, group, a group process like this. And, and so I'll say that, go ahead, go ahead, that everybody's, everybody's sharing resources, whether it's, um, you know, essential worker letters, um, policies, protocol, but also one of the, the nice things about the buildings is they, the, the staff, the boards, they care about, the residents. That's their number one priority. And so a lot of the buildings, they're putting together um, package, packets for all the residents. You know, they've even gotten them markers or crayons and they're giving them coloring pages and puzzles and activities and managers are putting on their door, even though I can't talk to you face to face, you know, we care about you. They're using their social media also to get those messages across that we care about you we're here for you. We just can't physically be with you because we're trying to keep you safe. So we're actually, we're doing, we're sharing best practices amongst ourselves um, in, during this crisis. But Mark, uh, and you have a, a long uh, record of accomplishment in, in the field of aging and aging studies. Um, are you telling me I'm are, getting older, Dan? Does that mean I'm getting older? Is that, well, the, is that the, No, just, just wiser. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, have a long, you have a long experience in the field, and, and there, are, there are organizations, there are national organizations uh, devoted to, to various aspects uh, of aging. Um, are we sharing some of these best practices 
in our own system with it to, to the broader community because we talk about at risk, we talk about seniors being the, uh, the most prominent of the at risk categories uh, in this, and we're talking about tens of, of millions of, of people. Um, from what we're learning now, and we're learning kind of you know on the on the run here, uh, are we sharing some of that with uh, with our colleagues in the, the broader field of aging? Well, I'm going to let um, uh, Janelle or Evan uh, comment, but my, my, let me just uh, start with by saying that we've always been very very active with the various other coalition groups mm. that deal with senior housing. Um, back back in the day, there was the Elderly Housing Coalition, which uh, was one of the better larger and most effective uh, groups. Uh, it was a coalition of um, like-minded agencies like B'nai B'rith who were involved in the senior housing programs. We would get together usually on a monthly basis um, and uh, or quarterly basis basically then got to monthly occasionally if, if there were some specific issues to deal with. But we always communicated with each other and then worked up strategies in order to work to go up on the hill or go to HUD or one of the other agencies. And so we always worked very closely. Um, those are happening even more now and uh, I think that um, uh, the coalitions now have changed. The, we're members of the uh, was it leading council of aging organizations, includes AARP and, and all the major groups, uh, including housers that, um, that are sharing um, pretty much day to day what's going on and how we can be helpful um, to each other and with, well, how we can devise strategies to talk to um, folks up on the Hill and other agencies to, to strengthen uh, these programs. So uh, if Janelle or Evan wanted to jump in to talk about the specific coalition work that we're doing, but I think it's, it's only becoming more and more important that we share these kinds of things. Well, I'll jump in first, then I'll let Evan. Not only the coalitions, but also management companies. So a lot of the different management companies that have a lot of properties that may manage one or two of our properties, we're sharing, they're, they're part of our conference calls. So they're sharing within their management networks also as well. Um, another partner that actually we do our um, Capitol Hill visits and calls with is the American Association of Service, Service Coordinators. We're very close to them and share a lot of resources and they've been sharing with us, especially with the service coordinators. And let me just jump in on the, on the uh, ask on the American Association of Service Coordinators, just, just for the record, uh, we were one of uh, a number of organizations who are highly supportive of that program coming together back uh, around the, the, I think it was around 2000, the early 2000s. And uh, we worked with uh, Jan Monks, who's the, the president, I guess, of, uh, of that organization and, uh, um, and, and helped pull that together because we recognized the need for, for service coordinators in the properties. So I feel very proud that we were one of the earlier groups to get involved with the program and help make it a national program as it is today. Evan, you like comment on that before we close? Yeah, I would certainly, I would certainly echo what Mark and Janelle just talked about um, from the vantage point of sometimes when we're on the phone for a, a coalition, you know, meeting, there's 50 other, you know, organizations on the phone. So it's really a great opportunity for everybody to, you know, swap the best, their best practice ideas also gives everybody an opportunity to really um, exchange their thoughts on the process, best ways to go up to Capitol Hill to advocate, and best ways to tell everybody in the field, which from uh, our vantage point are the buildings, the best things that they can, they can do. Well, uh, thank you uh, for that. And, and we are all very proud of uh, what each of you do and what our entire system does, not only uh, during uh, this time of crisis, but uh, every day, and it really is every day for seniors. It's, it's got to be every day. It's 24-7 and um, 365, and we, we certainly are, are proud of what you're doing. You know, there is the, um, the biblical dictum from the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. There is no, there is no greater principle or value uh, in, 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 in the Jewish experience uh, than, than that, the veneration uh, of, of seniors and how it translates from biblical times uh, down to to the very present. So thank you. Dan, Dan, can, I Dan, Dan, Dan. can I can I jump in real quick and just say, you know, we're here. We're supporting the staff and the residents and the boards of directors of our buildings, but they're in the trenches. They are the ones that are dealing with this on a daily basis, and they are heroes. 
all of them, whether it's I, staff or the residents. And um, I couldn't be more proud to try to support them any way I can, but they are. I, I, I was just going to jump yeah, in too, last word. I just wanted to say that we do have a dedicated cadre of local boards of directors and management professionals who are literally, as Janelle said, on the front lines. And I, I can't express how deeply appreciative um, we are for their efforts. Um, they are really, as Janelle said, true heroes, and they're the ones who are making this whole thing work and will get us through this uh, ridiculous, uh, crazy time we're living in. Well, great. Well, I, I want to thank uh, Mark and Janelle and Evan for taking the time today to speak with us about what B'nai B'rith is doing to help its senior housing community through this era of coronavirus. And thank you all for participating in today's webinar. I hope you can join us next time uh, as well. Uh, take care, everyone. For B'nai B'rith International, I'm Dan Mariashin.